Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Salam alaikum and welcome back to another edition of Muslims Uncensored with me, Robert Carter, and Roshan Sali, the Grey Fox. Now, just to start off by informing you that yes, we are broadcasting this on a Thursday, which is unusual because we normally release our episodes on a Wednesday. But because it's the last ten days of the holy month of Ramadan and our busy schedule, plus some. Uh, live fundraising appeals that we've been doing on the Wednesday, uh, we have moved it to Thursday for that reason. So after the holy month ends next week, we should be going back to our normal spot on Wednesday. But don't you worry, just stay tuned to Five Pillars because regardless of what day our content goes out, it's all good. So as long as you stay tuned, you will catch us eventually at some point during the week, inshallah, until we go back to normality. Now, uh, there is something else that's happened this holy month, which is uh, quite disturbing to say the least. That's what we're going to open up this episode about. Iftars are not unusual. Muslims gather with friends and family every day during the holy month to celebrate Islam and enjoy the fruits uh, following our uh, uh, difficult fast during the day. But there is a trend of genocide iftars, which I've come to refer to them as, where some Muslims unfortunately are gathering with uh, genocide enablers, those who support Israel, Zionists indeed in many cases, and are breaking bread with them. That's right. Whilst a genocide is literally ongoing against our Muslim brothers and sisters in Gaza, some Muslims in the West find it appropriate, indeed defend the concept of rubbing shoulders with those who support or enable or uh, are directly arming this genocide. Uh, Roshan, let me bring you in straight away on this and get your opinion. I guess uh, the two prominent examples we could start off with is there was one at Downing Street, mm. which British Muslims did attend, some of them at least. There was another planned for the White House in America, but actually American Muslims have shamed British Muslims a little bit here because they successfully boycotted the event by mm. and large and staged their own iftar protest outside the White House front gates. Uh, so quite an impressive demonstration there. Uh, what do you make of these genocide iftars, as I've come to know them? <laughs> and then there was the Concordia Forum one as well. We are, are we going to get that on to that later? We're discuss that, oh, yeah. We'll discuss that one separately. All right, so the Down Street iftar and the White House iftar. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a disgrace. I mean, we should have nothing to do with these people, uh, let alone break bread with them. Uh, the only interactions we should be having with the Tory government here or with Joe Biden in America is quite frankly confronting him about what he's doing to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. You know, they should not be friendly interactions, breaking bread over, over cozy iftar. Um, and I would add the Labour Party as well, but we'll get onto that a bit later. Um, yeah, I think the Downing Street iftar, judging by the pictures, it was unknown Muslims, no one prominent, no one that I recognise, and I'm someone who's uh, an observer of the Muslim community here in the UK. I think uh, a lot of them were kind of Tory, Muslim Tory politicians, councillors, perhaps MPs, maybe a few business people as well. Um, so they, they probably struggled to, to fill the room. It was James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, that hosted it. Now, he is massively pro-Israel. Uh, you know, we, he demonstrated that during his time as Foreign Secretary. I think he was one of the first government ministers to go to Israel after October the 7th as well. So, um, you know, these were just non-entities people um, that, but, but nevertheless, I think people have already started to name and shame them on Twitter. Uh, I think one is a business owner and already there are calls to boycott his business just because he was there. In terms of um, America, you know, I've, I've always criticized American Muslims quite strongly. I've always said you know, that they, they compromise too much, they, they sell out too much, they're so liberal, they um, kind of go against Islamic values to an unbelievable extent. Um, but they've actually shamed British Muslims because they, they, got, they got Biden to virtually cancel his iftar. I don't think there's been any images of Biden's iftar, has there? Not that I've seen, no. Apparently they scaled it down. Yeah. Apparently there was one, but they're not very proud of it because it was probably... They didn't film it or anything or that? Uh, not that I've seen. Uh, apparently some Muslims did still go, but like, for example, one of those that attended simply went to hand a letter of protest to the, to the president. Right, right. So even then his attendance was an act of protest in a way. You could debate whether he should have gone or so, not. Yeah. But it was, it was an absolute humiliation for the White House here. American Muslims, including prominent mu American Muslim organizations as yeah. well, got behind this community consensus to boycott Biden and to, to punish them politically for supporting this genocide, and they humiliated the president. There's no doubt about that. Can the same be said if we managed to achieve that here in, in the UK when we've seen the prime minister going into a mosque? I think it was, was it Regent's Park it was Mosque? Regent's Park Mosque. He attended an iftar at Regent's Park Mosque. It wasn't an iftar, it was more of a photo op. But, a photo but, yeah, but still, Park... that, that in itself is an embarrassment. Yeah, but Regent's Park Mosque, we all, we all know they're, they're run by the Saudis. 
uh, so the Saudis always had a very close relationship with the um, the British establishment. So we can't really expect much from Regents Park Mosque. They're not they're not a mosque that responds to the community. Normally, mosques in this country they're financed by their congregation, whereas Regents Park Mosque is financed by the Saudis. Um, Mr. Dubyan, who is the director of Regents Park Mosque, he's a he's a Saudi official uh, effectively. So the, the Regents Park Mosque have no have no relationship with the Muslim community. Even the, the even the congregation that go to the mosque, they just have. They don't, I don't think they even solicit for donations or anything like that. Every mosque you go to in the UK says donations for the mosque, please. You know and I don't think Regis Park Mosque does. Well, there you go. Uh, you mentioned it already, the Concordia Forum event. It was uh, an iftar that was held recently, and again, we had individuals mm. like the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, in attendance. Uh, but also there were some Muslims there as well. Uh, that, of course, sparked a massive backlash online because uh, some of the Muslims who attended, one in particular, uh, actually defended his actions mm. uh, by attending the iftar, claiming that it would further... Uh, the Muslim cause to be rubbing shoulders with the potential next prime minister and so on. Uh, his name was Nafiz Ahmed and you actually engaged in a, a, a Twitter exchange with him yes. over this. Perhaps you want to give us the context yeah, well, to this. Uh, before I get on to that, I sh I, one thing I forgot to mention about Biden is, brothers and sisters, we must keep an eye on this abandoned Biden campaign. I think after Ramadan we're going to probably interview the people behind it uh, because there's obviously this uh, campaign to by, by Muslim Americans to um, kick Biden out of office, even if that comes at the expense of Trump coming into office, because they just want to make a point that if yeah. you, yeah, if you support gen Israeli genocide, like Joe Biden has, and he is the main supporter, he could put an end to this tomorrow, because that's the influence America has over Israel. Uh, if you're going to do that, then we're going to try and kick you out of office. So just keep an eye on that, the abandoned Biden campaign in America. Yeah, so the Concordia Forum is a um, so-called Muslim institute, which has very close connections with uh, the establishment and the powers that be in Britain and America, I believe. It's run by a guy called Madassa Ahmed. Um, and I think it has close connections with Saudi Arabia as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they held an iftar, and Keir Starmer was invited to that iftar. Uh, David Lamy was invited, and uh, Shabana Mahmoud as well. So all these people that have stood full square behind Israel as it commits a genocide against our brothers and sisters, you know, Keir Starmer literally saying that Israel has the right to cut off water and electricity at one point. He backtracked on that, but the point has been made. Um, literally voting against a ceasefire, consistent labor policy. Up until the last few weeks, really, they've, they've changed over the last few weeks, but no one cares anymore because the damage has been done. You know, uh, 30,000 Palestinians have already been killed. So whatever they say now, who cares? Anyway, uh, Concordia Forum invited these genocide enablers, um, these people with literally blood on their hands, um, to a cozy little iftar. And unfortunately, uh, quite a few members of the Muslim community decided to attend as well. Uh, the ones that I recognized were Nafiz Ahmed, who is a writer for the Byline Times uh, and a general ju a, a journalist, and he has his own um, social media presence. Uh, he's called Mas M Nafiz Mossadegh Ahmed. And his wife is Akila Ahmed, um, who was involved with Muslim Youth Helpline back in the day. Um, she seems to be involved with pro-Israel circles and pro-establishment circles and pro-prevent circles as well, I think I'm right in saying that, although that needs to be checked. Um, but um, yeah, those two I recognize. Um, we have a little bit of history. Anyway, I had a twist, I had a, a twist spat with the... Um, with uh, Nafiz, and I said it's pathetic, you know, because he tries to defend his presence. So he said it was an important um, event to attend, and Keir Starmer has changed Labour policy. Maybe it's too little, too late, but we should have been there and we should have reported what he said, etc., etc. So I just said, pathetic, you broke bread in a cozy iftar with a genocide enabler. And then he comes out with a tweet saying that I'm a Holocaust denier, I'm an anti Semite, and I love the Taliban and ISIS. I'll read out his tweet to you uh, very quickly. I've reported on, he's referring to himself, I've reported on Gaza and Palestine for 20 years, broken exclusives on resource theft, genocidal violence, and been sacked by The Guardian as a result. You, Roshan, are an anti-Semite and Holocaust denier who fantasizes about the Taliban and ISIS. <laughs> Muslims don't need your fake activism. I mean, yeah, I couldn't so believe that. that. Yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> okay, I mean... Let me just start off, Roshan, by just saying, because obviously I, I've known you for a, a while now. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never actually met uh, Nafiz Ahmed at all. And all of those things. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, ju judging by this tweet, I mean, this guy is, is a shameless bootlicker yeah. 
who should be absolutely ashamed of himself. I mean, Muslims have disagreements all the time, but never in my right mind would I expect someone who claims to be a Muslim to yeah. come out with these right-wing talking points attacking someone who, I mean, Roshan, you've been to Gaza. Yeah. You've been I to don't Gaza. Think he says. Yeah. You've been to Gaza, yeah. you've been reporting on the Palestinian cause for your entire professional career yeah. as far as I know. Uh, you're one of the most staunchest, uh, unapologetic Muslim voices in this country to the point where your platform, Five Pillars, is actually being criticised by people in government yeah. because of the work you do. I mean, if that isn't what a journalist should be doing, then I don't know what is. How dare this guy, Nafiz, talk to you in that way? Would he talk to Keir Starmer in this way, someone who sure actually wouldn't. has the blood of Muslims on his hand yeah. in Gaza. I don't think so. I mean, that's a disgusting, shameful, humiliating tweet, and he's only lashing out because he is a humiliated, mind-colonized little bootlicker. As far as I I'm mean, concerned. he's he's got pelters for that tweet. Uh, Good. If you look, if you he look under, if you look at his Twitter, it. he's got absolute pelters for it. Good. Um, I, I th I'm going to have to explain this. It's going to take me a few minutes, unfortunately. I'll try and. Tell you the, the short Explain version. your links to ISIS. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's break it down. The, the reason why Nafiz Ahmed is so confident in calling me a Holocaust denier and a anti-Semite is because of Peter Oborn. Because Peter Oborn, who are lots of Muslims love in this country for some reason, um, he called me an anti-Semite and a Holocaust denier in, in the British Journalism Review. I asked Peter Oborn several times to retract. He wouldn't retract. Um, and he's based that on the fact that I had a conversation with Ken Livingston once where we talked about the Holocaust, uh, and we talked about the numbers of the Holocaust. And now, I clearly said in that interview that it's a genocide. Uh, it is a Holocaust. Um, millions of Jews died. Whether it's six or less, I'm not sure, because I know that, um, uh, I think I said, I know that even Israel disputes that. Some Israeli historians say five million died. Some say two million died. But the fact is, millions have died. On the basis of that, Peter Robin called me a Holocaust denier. I obviously didn't deny the Holocaust. Um, and that's why Nafiz Ahmed is and an anti-Semite. And, and uh, Peter Robin also said that I criticize, um, I criticize Israel above and beyond other countries. Uh, and that's why that's one of the reasons why I'm an anti-Semite. So obviously that is a Hasbro talking point as well. Um, so it's mm. complete rubbish. Peter Oborn completely out of order. We have nothing to do with Peter Oborn on Five Pillars, and never will do because of that. I discourage um, you know Muslims from giving Peter Oborn any credence, credence whatsoever because of the way he treated me and you know slandered me basically. Uh, and that is why Nafiz Ahmed is, is confident calling me those things. Taliban, I guess. Uh, I guess it's because of my reporting from Afghanistan. Now, I'm not going to come on here and cuss the Taliban, uh, but you guys can look at my YouTube reporting from Afghanistan uh, on the Five Pillars YouTube page, and you can judge for yourself whether I love the Taliban or not. Uh, I make no further comment. ISIS is a complete lie, a complete slander and a fabrication. I've consistently been against ISIS. Even last week, we outrageous. were cussing ISIS. Literally, he called me an, an ISIS fantasist. I mean, that is absolute slander. But unfortunately, um, uh, people can say what they want about me in this country because of who I am and the controversial views. I, I don't consider them controversial, but because of the Islamic views I have, uh, I don't think a court in this country would give me a fair hearing. So I can't really, um, I can't really sue anybody. You could call me an anti-Semite now. I couldn't sue you. All I could do is punch you in the nose, but I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't sue you. Well, so that's. But I can mean, I say one thing more? Uh, and it's important context. I know I've been going on a bit. Uh, Nafiz doesn't like me. Um, I think because of his time in the Muslim Youth Helpline, this is about 10 years ago over there, and they had um, an internal dispute amongst the staff at the Muslim Youth, youth Helpline, which Akila, his wife, ran. And basically information about the staff ended up with the counter-terrorism police. Uh, and because of that, I, I reported on this story. And because of that, I think that led to Akila leaving uh, the Muslim Youth Helpline under a cloud. And ever since that, Akila and, um, and Nafiz, obviously, they don't like me. So that's the, that's the back story. Well, I think that, you know, this guy's obviously a bit of a dweeb and a bootlicker. I mean, I don't like him. I've never met him and I don't like him just but based on his actions here. I mean, the fact he's like lecturing you about The Guardian. Oh, I got sacked from The Guardian because of the work I did. Well, no one cares. Like, who likes The Guardian? Mm. The Guardian's no like uh, a flag waved in the, the Muslim community. You know, no one respects The Guardian. The Guardian's legacy media that lies all the time. No Muslim respects The Guardian that much for, for someone to be like, yeah, I, I worked for The Guardian. So uh, this guy, I think he should just be happy with the Labour Party, these other genocide enablers. Uh, just, you shouldn't have intended the iftar. Simple as that. It's as simple as that. You should not break bread with people that are responsible for the, the death and destruction in Gaza. Absolutely. Well, uh, let's go to uh, the next story because obviously there's been a massive uh, escalation happening in 
the Middle East. Uh, Israel has bombed and killed seven aid workers mm. who were trying to distribute aid in Gaza. Uh, it's caused quite an uproar, more so than uh, in past examples where Israel has killed aid workers, simply because three Brits were also involved uh, were also killed, excuse me, uh, as part of the aid convoy. Now, obviously, Israel has apologized for that, uh, but they still face relentless grilling by British journalists and the British government, of course, is trying to navigate through this. Uh, Roshan, what's your reaction to this? Because obviously it's quite a big story, but I think there's a bit of double standards going on here at the moment. Yeah, um, I think you're more on top of the story than me, but it, it seems as though Israel did target these aid workers. And now there's uh, uproar even amongst the, the media class and the political class in the UK about maybe stopping arms sales to Israel because of it. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the hypocrisy really does stink. I mean, 34,000 Palestinians dead and no one was talking about stopping arms sales to Israel. But now suddenly, uh, you know, a few white Brits and a few, you know, Western internationals have been killed. Now it's like a massive... It just, it just shows you that Palestinian blood is worth less than white blood, you know, quite frankly. Um, but what, what I find interesting is I, I don't quite get why Israel have done this because they seem to have... It doesn't seem to be a, a mistake, you know. It, um, uh, they seem to have deliberately targeted their cars. They, the, the, they knew there were aid workers. They were clearly marked as aid workers. Even the route was a, like an Israeli-approved route. Yes, so why right. would they have killed these people? That's what the big question, because obviously uh, supporters of Israel are rallying mm. behind the anti-Semitism uh, oh, because we all hate Jews, that's it. Sorry, let's move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, they say if you imply that um, Israel like, did it on purpose, they knew yeah. what was going on before killing them, uh, you're an anti semite basically, because, yes. you know, it's, you know, mistakes are made in war. But, I mean, if you just look at the sheer number of UN aid worker, UN workers who have been getting killed here, journalists, many, many journalists have been getting killed, uh, and now you have this incident, and again, everything you've listed there just clearly they, they must, I mean, how did they not know who those cars were? There yeah. was, it was a convoy of cars which they hit one after the other. And I mean, my goodness, how on earth? I mean, is Israel stupid? Is their intelligence network I think, stupid? I think, how, how else could you explain it? Their intelligence team must be a bunch of idiots then. I think they genuinely have a, a sense of impunity that they can do whatever they want. And they don't even seem to care about international public opinion or even American opinion. America is literally mm. their biggest sponsor and they're annoying you know, they're peeing off America in, in a big way. They're obviously incredibly trigger happy. They do have nutters and psychopaths working for them. Who knows, it could be someone in the control room, as you said to me before, the camera started rolling, uh, who's just a psychopath who decided, right, I'm gonna kill some aid, work aid workers today. Yeah. It doesn't, I, I, think, I think literally the, the psychopathic nature and genocidal nature of, of Israeli society from like every single, nearly every single element of society uh, it's so pervasive that I think they can, they, they, they literally see Palestinians and the whole of Palestine as a video game. It's like Call of Duty, that it's eliminating people, an aid worker one day, a journalist the next day, a civilian the next day, a Hamas fighter the next day. You know, yeah. it all blurs into one for them. I mean, just look at the IDF, man. I mean, they're killing, we, we see their uh, members of the IDF going on TikTok mm. in uniform and they're literally celebrating and saying, yes, we are killing uh, guards and civilians and we're happy about it. Like literally, it's a, it's a trend. There's been multiple viral videos where they're literally saying, yeah, I'm killing Gazans, good. Like I want all Gazans to die. Mm. I want to colonize Gaza. I want to uh, capture Gaza and settle there. Do you know what I mean? And I mean, you have to think about how Israel is. It's a colonialist project, which its, its survival is based on being able to force the Palestinians out either by mass expulsion or just by killing them. Mm. So you have a couple of generations now that have been born in, in occupied Palestine, these Israelis, and they're being taught from childhood you have to arm, be ready to fight, and when the time is right, kill as many Palestinians as you can. Just kill, kill, kill. Mm. So you have a generation now, and I think we're seeing the fruits of that now. That's why the, the death count is high. That's why there's so many women and children getting killed. That's why aid workers are getting targeted. I mean, even their own um, hostages, there was a case where their own hostages waving white flags were Shut gunned them. down. The guy behind the gun must have seen, I assume, that there were these people running in with white flags, and he was like, do you know what? And, and let's face it, on October, shoot first, questions later. Let's face it, on October the seventh, the same thing happened. They killed loads of their own people. Shoot first, ask questions later. That's what we have heard. So yeah, let's uh, let's leave that where it is for now. We're going to see where it goes. Obviously, a big push to try and uh, stop arms sales to Israel is now happening, and it seems as if, according to recent polling, that there is a significant number of people in this country that would actually support 
uh, at least a temporary ban on arms sales to Israel. So let's see, maybe uh, the time for change is coming. But, but before we move on, I mean, how pathetic that is. I mean, six months of genocide, and that's what the British public offer up. I mean, mm. crumbs, absolute I crumbs. I know. Well, uh, let's go to this next story very quickly. Al Jazeera has uh, basically faced a ban in Israel and has come under attack mm. from the Prime Minister after a new law was introduced by the Knesset, which basically allows them to temporarily at least sus suspend foreign media, which is deemed a threat to national security. Uh, Netanyahu attacked Al Jazeera on X straight away after the law was introduced, referring to them in the translation as a, a terrorist channel. Now, this is obviously because Al Jazeera, which is based in Qatar, has reported on their mm. crimes, so they, they don't want that out there, so they've branded it a threat to security. Uh, Roshan, what's your reaction to this? Because I know you used to work for Al Jazeera. Yeah, a long time ago, um, well over a decade ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago, I, I used to work for them longer than that. Gosh, shows how old I am. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I've had my criticism of Al Jazeera over the years, um, and even when I was working there, I didn't have a great time overall because I, I just felt the management was rubbish. And, and uh, you know, obviously their allegiance is to the state of Qatar before anything else. That's why I always differentiate kind of what we do, where our allegiance is to Allah and His Messenger, uh, whereas a TRT, you know, state media, their, their allegiance is to Turkey, Al Jazeera is to Qatar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, however. I think over the last six months, they have done an exemplary job, especially Al Jazeera Arabic. I'm mainly talking about Al Jazeera Arabic. Al Jazeera English is more westernized. Even they've done a, a decent job. Al Jazeera Arabic have given everything. You know, literally their correspondents have given their lives. Yes. They've given their children, their, their wives, uh, their properties, their wealth, absolutely everything. Their reporting has been amazing. I mean, obviously, I, 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 I speak Arabic reasonably well, so I watch them all the time, and they're the first to everything. They get the best access. A lot of the stuff that we have taken and put on Five Pillars is from Al Jazeera, and we admit that openly. Um, we give them the credit first um, because they've just been the best, and they've, they've exposed Israeli barbarism for everything that it is. Um, they've just done an amazing, amazing job, um, which makes me kind of put all my issues with them to one side for the moment. And um, and that's why they've been banned, because Israel doesn't want anyone to uncover the truth. They are anti-truth. They, they don't want the, the bare face of their genocide to be exposed. Absolutely. I, I must admit that if Al Jazeera had been maybe a European channel, uh, I'm sure they would have got awards for their journalism. But mm. because obviously they're in the Muslim Arab world, they're going to be um, yeah. ignored that. In fact, that who knows where it's going to go. The, the censorship in the West is so strong at the moment, and everyone in the establishment is so staunchly behind Israel and what they're doing. Al Jazeera may face more censorship. We'll have to wait and see. But yeah, their journalism has been second to none, uh, especially on this uh, uh, genocide in Gaza. And we'll, we have to support them. Uh, uh, we, we discussed one of their journalists who had lost his family, as you had said. Why uh, that too? Yeah, yes, that too. absolutely. And um, yeah, we can only offer them prayers and support of the work that they're doing and try to emulate them as well. Uh, let's go on to Israel because uh, Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria. So this was a massive story a couple of days ago and we're still waiting yes. to see if there will be any uh, response for that attack from the Iranian side. Uh, so obviously a number of senior Iranian uh, uh, members of the IRGC were also killed in that uh, attack on the embassy and Israel has claimed that it was basically a, a base for Iran and their military chiefs. Iran has denied that. Uh, what do you think, Roshan? Is there going to be a, a heavy reaction? The, the president of Iran did vow yeah. revenge. Well, um, no, <laughs> I don't think there will be a heavy reaction. Um, obviously, Benjamin Netanyahu's strategy is to widen the war. So he's desperately trying to provoke Iran into some kind of response so that he can widen the war. I think he sees his own political survival in a, in a wider regional war. He wants it because he's a psychopath. Um, it's a declaration of war in Iran, you know, because obviously Israel and Iran, they fight each other using proxies usually. So, um, you know, the, the Iranians will use Hezbollah, they will use the Houthis and Hamas to attack Israel, um, and Israel will maybe strike Iran in Syria, but not Iran directly. But this was not just an attack on a Syrian base, it was an attack on an Iranian embassy. So it's a declaration of war, because uh, embassies are supposed to have immunity, wherever they are in the world. Even if you're literally at war with somebody, the embassy has an immunity. These, this is a diplomatic protocol. Um, will Iran respond? I think they will respond somehow, but they'll result... Uh, basically, Iran's, um, you know, 
bark is, is usually bigger than its bite. But that's, that's the reality, and they, they, there's a lot of bluster when it comes from Iran when the, in their rhetoric, in their actions. I mean, I have to temper what I say because Iran has done more than any Sunni Arab state. Full stop. You know, I'm a Sunni saying that, and th that's the fact. You know, Iran basically, in terms of how it's um, fought Israel, no, it hasn't fought Israel directly. No, it hasn't uh, challenged Israel directly, but it has armed and trained Hamas and Hezbollah, which have attacked Israel directly, and even the Houthis, you know, uh, Israeli shipping in, in, the, in the Gulf. So um, Iran stands head and shoulders above any, uh, any Sunni Arab state in what it's done. And Hamas recognized that, you know, and uh, Palestinian groups recognize that. However, will Iran go for an all-out war with Israel? No, I don't think they, they will, because their calculation is they'll lose that war. Um, and they always have an eye on the long term. You can criticize them for that, and many people do. Many people feel that they've been humiliated by Israel, and all they've done is, you know, bark back words. Um, you know, others will say, no, if Iran confronts Israel completely, it will be a disaster. Israel will be able to clean up. They will have the excuse to clean up the whole region, and then it will be Israeli hegemony for 100 years, you know? So I've yet to kind of um, conclude what the, the right policy is. I can kind of understand both points of view. I guess uh, what I tend to do is wait for hindsight and then lecture him yeah. who was right and wrong. <laughs> so that, I guess that's what I'll do. But uh, yeah, I mean... But Iran is not I above think... criticism because Iran's supporters, if you, if you mention this to them, they will bite back at you in a big way mm. and, and say, no, we, we're playing chess while you're playing checkers. We know what we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's, um, you know, some people that hate Iran so much that they can't acknowledge anything that I Iran has done. Yeah. I tend to take a more kind of um, a balanced view. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, people in the West, for example, looking at this might not care, you know, about uh, a war in the Middle East. That's the problem that we have for many Brits in this country is they just don't care. But what people here need to start asking themselves is, why are we so aligned to this rogue regime in Tel Aviv that's literally hell-bent on dragging the Western world into World War III? Mm. Like, literally, that's how it seems. For ages now, we've heard stories about Tel Aviv lobbying the White House to go to war with Iran on their behalf, uh, and so on and so forth. The UK would obviously join in on that as well as it always does. And what would a war with Iran mean for the West? It would mean misery. I mean, we're already facing economic hardships because of Ukraine yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. And Israel just constantly trying to start World War Three. I think the, the, the West really needs to wake up and yeah. start to reevaluate its relationship because constantly we're throwing arms at them, money, whatever they need. And what are we getting back for it? Genocide and uh, economic hardships and yeah. uh, the threat of Nothing. World War Three. I mean, the final point I want to make about this is that Iran, whatever you think about Iran, and obviously a lot of Muslims hate Iran because of the Syria situation, but they're a rational actor. You know, they calculate their actions and they, they unleash their hell when it's in their advantage to do so after cal calculating very thoroughly and they restrain themselves from acting also after, uh, you know, deliberate calculation. Whereas Israel is the irrational actor which is the crazy actor, which does crazy things like, like target aid workers and journalists. And so I, literally I would say that Iran is rational, whatever you think of it, whether it's disagree with it or not, whereas Israel is completely irrational. Let's go on to, uh, let's completely change uh, the tempo here and move on to a talk which uh, world famous atheist uh, Richard Dawkins gave on LBC recently. Mm. I'm actually going to load up a clip and see if we can play it out here. He basically uh, spoke on LBC and he did a really weird thing. He, he kind of defended cultural Christianity and attacked Islam whilst kind of defending Christianity at the same time. So I'll see if I can play out a bit now, give us a taste of what he actually said. Which brings um, me to, to my supplementary point, which is that, as we know, church attendance is plummeting, but the building, the erection of mosques across Europe, I think 6,000 are under construction and there are many more, I mean, are being planned. So do you think... Do you regard that as a problem? Do you think that matters? Yes, I do, really. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I have to choose my words carefully. I mean, I, if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I'd choose Christianity every single time. I mean, it seems to me to be a, a fundamentally decent religion um, <laughs> in a way that I think Islam is not. I think you're going to have to explain why you say that. Professor Dawkins, well, why is Islam profoundly well, the, the way, the fundamentally way that, not decent like Christianity? 
Yes, I mean, the, 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 the way women are treated, I mean, Christianity is not great about that. It's had its problems with female vicars and female bishops and things. But there's an active hostility to women, which is promoted, I think, by the holy books of Islam. I'm not talking about individual Muslims, who, of course, are quite, quite different. But the, but the doctrines of Islam, the Hadith and the, and the Quran, it's fundamentally um, hostile to women, hostile to gays, um, and uh, I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do. So there you go, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, everyone, uh, talking about how culturally Christian he is, mm. even though he ultimately could be uh, credited with helping to bring down the Christian church in this country, highlighting how awful religion is and uh, encouraging people to abandon religion in droves. Uh, now that Christianity's died here, Islam is stepping up. He's now going, oh, well, I don't like that. I don't want this to become a Muslim country. I want it to be a culturally Christian, whatever that means. Uh, Roshan, give me a reaction. Um, well, he doesn't hate religion at all. He just hates Islam, doesn't he? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> when picked to just choose. I mean, he likes Christianity because it's a defeated religion. Um, yeah. And Christianity is not a religion anymore. It's just a kind of happy, clappy, sending out Christmas cards and consumerism and... Yeah, it's not a religion anymore, and that, that's why he likes it so much. Uh, but obviously he's, relig he's religiously illiterate because, I mean, Christianity, I mean, they were burning women at the stake, weren't they? And, you know, the Bible is full of anti-gay stuff and uh, anti-women stuff. And They have the Sodom and Gomorrah story, yeah. uh, just as, as uh, Islam does as well, you that's know. That's in the Bible, so yeah. Highlighting that was just stupid. Uh, the women's rights thing, I mean, when Islam came, it was actually like a liberating force for women mm. on the world stage, yes. you know, especially at that time. I mean, Arabs were burying uh, uh, newborn uh, female children in the, in the sand because they were deemed like useless. They were basically yeah. just, for pr they, they couldn't have property, they were property. Mm. And as you say, uh, Christianity was burning them at the stake for being witches. Um, so Islam came Islam and actually... Islam loads of rights. Inheritance absolutely. rights. Inheritance, right to ownership. Uh, mm. Yeah, obviously they have rights when they get married as well. You can't just do whatever you want. And I think a lot of the... Um, I mean, this is quite controversial, but I think a lot of the natural instinct of a lot of men would be to give women less rights than Islam does. <laughs> yeah. It would be. Islam gives them more rights. Allah gives them more rights than perhaps male instinct would. Well, that's why they didn't have any. That's yeah. why they didn't have any before yeah. Islam. You know, They yeah. literally had no rights. Zero. Yeah. Islam brought and gave them a whole bunch of rights. And a lot of men would like that. <laughs> it, it's true. It's it's true, but Islam has come to educate us. Well, I think that that's stupid. He said other things as well, like Christianity is decent, Islam is not. I mean, how do you respond to He's that? He's only saying that, as I say, because it, 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 Christianity is a defeated religion, whereas Islam isn't. Islam is alive. It's alive in mosques, it's alive in our hearts, it's alive in our recitation. Just in, in, in Ramadan, you can see how alive Islam is uh, in our fasting, our ibadah, our charity, um, in absolutely everything. Whereas Christianity, I mean, its, it's biggest festival is Christmas. It's not even a Christian festival. It's a consumerist festival. Festival. And yeah, um, yeah he's, he's obviously worried about the rise of Islam. So yeah, I mean, he's an old guy now. I'm guessing he must be well into his 70s, uh, late 70s. And he's been instrumental in the defeat of Christianity in this country, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, he can see the rise of Islam. So he's only succeeding in, you know, replacing one with the other. <laughs> the, fa the fact of the matter is that, you know, if he's upset, I mean, if he wants to preserve churches in this country, he said he loves churches and cathedrals, yeah. he doesn't want to give that up. The best thing for, for the UK to do is give them to Muslims. We'll convert them into mosques, as we are already doing, which uh, means that we'll preserve them as a house of worship. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we'll respect the grounds yeah. and take good care of it and preserve it. I mean, right now, you see churches left dilapidated. Uh, they're abandoned empty. Mm. They receive no funding unless it's from the state, like the Church of yeah. England institutions. But again, they're empty and abandoned. No one cares about them. No one respects them. If, uh, if they were given to us as, as they should be, then at least we would protect them as a house of worship. Do you know what I mean? And we'll yeah. fill them up. They'll be active. They're, uh, uh, Allah, the creator of the universe, will be worshipped in there once again. So I think that, you know, we need to really break this idea that, you know, the UK is a Christian country. It is not a Christian country anymore. There's, there's, no, there's it's a secular country. It's, it's, and there is a massive appetite in this country for religion because people are still religious and they're spiritual, but they're, they're misguided and they're lost. Islam is stepping in for a reason and people are responding well. Mm. You've got loads of Islamophobes, we know that. But 
the youth. Who will, who a lot of them eventually will become Muslims. Absolutely, <laughs> inshallah, or their descendants will. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, there's so many young people in this country I've noticed that are really interested in Islam. There's something in Islam for everyone as we've discussed already on the show. And the fact is that Islam is a force for good and we need to combat because if we allow the Richard Dawkins to get away with what they're doing, mm. then ultimately, you know, the ills of society which the West has become famous for like uh, you, you, you don't even know what gender you are now, you know, depression, suicide rates are through the roof. Uh, that's the consequence of the destruction of religion. Exactly. And so Islam is stepping up, Islam is the future, Islam can save some lives. So we have to hit back and keep pushing Islam because that is one of the most but, effective but, things um, we can do to save I mean, Like it saved your life, like Islam saved your life. It can yeah. save Britain, it literally can save Britain. Absolutely. I mean, I always just say to Christians, you know, that, um, you know, your religion is dead and uh, your, your vicars and priests the leaders of your religion won't defend it. So what's the point? If you, if, you, if you believe in God and you have a spiritual yearning, come to Islam. We'll welcome you with open arms. You will find a home. You'll find a community. You'll find people that love you and take care of you, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that believe in something, that have strong anchors, whether it's family anchors, religious anchors, spiritual anchors. You know? So come to us. You know, Come to us. We will welcome you with open arms. Absolutely. If Unless you want... you're a spy and then we'll pick you out. <laughs> if you want to be part of a principled religion that doesn't sell out, that's a winning formula for life, yeah. that's literally growing and growing and growing. You know, we are the winners. We are a winning community. Join us. Join us. We are here. We're ready for you. We're ready for you at Five Pillars even. Uh, but before we end the show, Roshan, there is uh, our fundraising is still ongoing. Yes. So maybe you want to uh, just update the community because we've got yeah. one there tomorrow, right? Our next live Alhamdulillah, video. brothers and sisters. Um, you know, you've given a lot to us this Ramadan already. What are we on now? Uh, Ramadan 26, is it? Or yes. 26. I've lost count. Yeah. So it could be Laid al-Qadr. Laid al Any of these last 10 nights could be Laid al-Qadr. Uh, but I think the, the, the odd nights is a stronger opinion. So 27th. So we've got a fundraising appeal uh, hosted by Dilly, as usual, uh, coming up tomorrow on the 27th. Um, that will be about school protests, I think, uh, LGBT pro-Palestine school protests. Yes, and uh, censorship of the Palestinian cause. Yeah, 29th. Yeah. Do you remember what 29th fundraiser is about? I'm no, not sure. No. Yeah, oh, you're paying attention, aren't you? Really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I go one at a time. Like, it could be Palestine. I'm not sure. Yeah. So we've got two fundraising um, appeals coming up. Alhamdulillah, we've had um, two already, uh, or three already. I've lost count. And they've done very well, Alhamdulillah, you've given. Um, we need to maximize the donations. Uh, and we'll be pushing, pushing. We've done well so far. We are very grateful. We're going to put your money to, to good use. We have a bigger budget this year coming up than we had last year, alhamdulillah. But we need to keep pushing, pushing, pushing until the end of Ramadan. Give, 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 give. If you've already given, give more. If you have nothing to give, then tell your friends and family to give. At the very least, share the links and the social media campaigns that we will provide you with that are all over Five Pillars social media so that we can maximize the amount of donations that we get until the end of Ramadan. And then after that, we will leave you alone and get on with the work. Yeah, absolutely. We don't bombard you with text messages throughout the year like uh, some others do. There we is just... some, I say that, there is some speculation we might do a little Hijra campaign um, and then a, a December campaign and then a January campaign. And then, no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, we, we might do a, a little Hijra campaign uh, this year. We haven't decided yet. Uh, but in general, in the past, we've just campaigned, or, you know, yeah. done a campaign during Ramadan and that's it. But just so that you don't play this again when we do our Dil Hijji campaign, <laughs> we might do a Dil Hijji campaign. Yeah, but it's for a good reason, as, uh, as Roshan says. I mean, obviously, we're a grassroots organization. We receive no state funding. You know, we haven't got a fat, juicy budget, which we enjoy, like Al Jazeera does. Uh, where and you and me are puppies, aren't we? We're just puppies. <laughs> we're living a puppy Look lifestyle. Look at Roshan's jumpers. Like, come on, man. Look at how dresses. <laughs> I tell you what, brothers and sisters, you've all got, you all live in better properties than we do. Seriously, you know, we, we literally, we are povies. Yeah. No, no, I shouldn't say that. We're, we're not povies, but, but no, you know. We're, we're humble Muslims. We're humble, ordinary job. Muslims. Yeah, we, ain't, humble. we ain't living the millionaire lifestyle. <laughs> and nor would we want to, uh, unless it, it came our way. Wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I would Good. You'd say that. You'd take a million, wouldn't you? Uh, while I'm poor, I'm going to remain humble. When yeah. I'm rich, I'll just completely do what you tell me. But now, all the, the money goes to a good cause and obviously keeps us doing what you guys appreciate the most, which is doing uh, a hard-hitting journalism and making a real impact as much as we can. And Right now with the situation in Gaza and the censorship that Muslims are facing here in this authoritarian nation that we call the UK, uh, it's incredibly important that we receive that support because it will 
keep us doing what you want to do. So, uh, is there anything else you want to? No, add? just just stick the um, the donation link at the top of the YouTube I'll, comments. I certainly will. Yeah. I certainly will. Well, thank you very much for joining us on this latest edition of Muslims Uncensored, and be sure that we will be coming back next week for another edition as well, inshallah. But take care, and in those final nights of the holy month, inshallah, please remember us in your prayers as well. Uh, Roshan, <laughs> so I always forget. So, and brothers and sisters, we may not do Muslims Uncensored less, next week because it's Eid. Um, so oh, we'll probably yes. see you in two weeks, not one week. Absolutely. Inshallah. Okay, so there we go. Inshallah, we'll be back. So just keep your eye on Five Pillars, and uh, Inshallah, we'll keep doing all the work that you appreciate the most. Just keep like, sharing, and subscribing because it helps our channel immensely as we keep trying to make that important impact. But for now, Salaamu Alaikum. God bless you all.